Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. We exist to lead unchurched people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We are a people, not a place, and are sent to make a difference in our world. Clear Creek gathers for worship online and across multiple campuses in the Bay Area of Houston. For more information, visit us at clearcreek.org. Hey, welcome and thanks for engaging with us online today. If this is your first time connecting with Clear Creek, we really hope that this won't be your last. In fact, we would love to know that you are watching and that you're worshiping with us today. We believe that the church isn't just a service that you attend or that you watch online. In fact, the church is a people that you connect with and that you grow with. And so you can let us know that you're engaging with us today by going to clearcreek.org. You can click on the I'm new button or send us a direct message on any of our social media platforms. Hey, we would love to connect with you. If Clear Creek is your church home and you just want to know what's going on this week, you can also go to clearcreek.org. You can give online. You can subscribe to our communication loop and check out any classes or events that are coming up this season. We're glad that you're joining us today. Let's jump in together. is greater you light our way God you light our way when evil is rising you're rising higher with power to save with power to save you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end Jesus, you are alive. 
So it was pre-quarantine, if you remember that time, when Kristen Gonzalez and her husband Manuel volunteered for a go-op with the Bridge Over Troubled Water Women's Shelter. They were helping move women from the shelter to independent living situations. And Kristen and Manuel and their group were assigned to a lady named Yahida. She was a young Spanish-speaking woman with two young children and a third one on the way. The small group helped Yahida get Christmas gifts for her kids and get connected with Vida, Clear Creek's Spanish-speaking partner church. And through the time that they spent with Yahida, Kristen discovered that this young mother didn't have anybody to accompany her to the hospital for her upcoming delivery. She was gonna be alone. So, despite the language gap, Kristen offered to go with her. And when the day came, Kristen took her to the hospital and sat with her in her hospital room through the labor and the delivery. And even though they couldn't talk to each other, they used Google Translate to communicate. So Kristen got to pray with her, encourage her, and celebrate with her with the arrival of her beautiful baby girl. It's stories like this that remind us that there is no obstacle too great for the gospel, and there's no situation too awkward or uncomfortable for the love of Jesus Christ. You know, Kristen's story reminds us of the unity that we can have amidst our diversity. Even though these two women were separated by a language barrier and culture, that doesn't hinder Kristen from, from stepping into this woman's life and giving of her time and her resources to help in really a time of need. So listen, we've all been reminded and challenged with ways to walk in unity throughout this series. But what a beautiful picture of serving people and of what we call whole life generosity. And so I hope that that story inspires you with a practical, kind of this tangible look at how you can be a part of applying this series and the gospel in our world today. You know, another opportunity for generosity is just the regular rhythms by which we participate in worship through giving. So if you've been engaging with us online, if you consider Clear Creek your church home, listen, we give not out of obligation or duty. We, we do this as an act of worship. It's an act of devotion for us. And by giving back to God, it supports the local mission and ministry, kind of the work of God at Clear Creek Community Church. So during the season, many of us have been giving online. And so if you'd like to start that rhythm of generosity with us, you can go to clearcreek.org, click where it says giving, and you can join us in that act of worship on a regular rhythm. But if you're just checking out Clear Creek online, man, if this, is, if this isn't your church home yet, please don't feel obligated by that. That's not obligation. We really want this online service to be a gift to you, especially if you're exploring faith in Jesus. Well, today, we're gonna wrap up a series we've called United. You're gonna hear from our teaching pastor, Yancey Arrington. But before we do that, I'd like to take a moment, just spend some time in prayer together, really as an act of worship, before we open the scriptures, let's pray together. So will you bow with me? Father, we do come to you as an act of worship. We acknowledge that you are good, that you love us, that you have sent your son Jesus to not only die for our sins, but to, to unite us at the cross. And so God, we pray for unity in this season. God, in a really divided world, in a world that, that would like to polarize us in extremes, God, would you bring unity? And God, not just conformity, but this, this ultimate desire to be a, a worshiping community that prioritizes our faith in Jesus first and foremost. And so God, in a, in a week like this where uh, new regulations and mask mandates expire and things that could divide us, God, I do continue to pray for unity. Father, I pray for unity, not only in our church, but also in our families. God, for marriages today, as people sit on their couches together and worship online, God, I pray for those marriages, for families. God, I pray for unity in our workplaces and in our schools. God, we just continue to pray for that. But God, now as we turn our attention to your scriptures, would you speak to us? Would you say what, what each of us need to hear? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Would you convict us through your holy scriptures today and through Yancey's words? God, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I love to read. I consider myself a kind of a bibliophile. I read a lot of books. At least I think uh, I read a lot of books. Um, and People ask me who find out that I, I like to read, like often I'll get this question like, hey, what are your top five or top 10 books of all time? Which is, I think, such an unfair question because I like so many, but I can tell you this. Uh, in my top five, if I had a top five, uh, 
uh, Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove would be a part of it. I mean, that's easily, that's, that's, uh, I think every Texan ought to read it. Not every Texan has, probably most of them haven't. But if you're old enough, maybe you remember that 1989 miniseries. How many of you ever saw that? I mean, I just want to, who's a real Texan? Okay, good. I just want to know. Um, if you haven't seen it, because I know it was there a long time ago, 89, right? But it, when, it, when it came out, it was a huge hit. And part of the reason it was a huge hit wasn't just the writing or how faithful it was to the book, but because the casting was perfect. In fact, they have a lot of really, like even today, you know, A-list actors that, that portrayed roles in that film or in that miniseries. Um, it, I'm not going to give away the whole story, but I will tell you this. Part of the reason that movie was so successful is that the main two protagonists are played by these guys, if you'll see here. Uh, you've, you've got Robert Duvall and Tommy Lee Jones. And they respectively play uh, Woodrow, I should say this, this is Woodrow Call, and this is Gus McRae, and they're these salty, seasoned, retired Texas Rangers who are leading their cowboy outfit out of Texas, uh, somewhere up in the Northwest, on a cattle drive. <clears throat> and one of, the, one of the parts of the, one of the tensions and dynamics in the story of Lonesome Dove is Call has a illegitimate child that he won't acknowledge a son named Newt Dobbs, who happens to be uh, a part of their outfit as well. And, and there's this underlying thing the whole time, he'll never show affection to him. never wants anyone to know or to let on that he and this kid might be related. And so it's almost like he's just almost too tough with him. But then there's a scene that's famously played in the film <clears throat> that kind of shows that he really does have something toward this young man named Newt. The outfit finds himself in a town as they're on their way in their cattle drive. They're all getting supplies. Actually, Call and Goss are in the general store getting like, you know, oats and stuff for their horses. And there is this U.S. Army troop that comes through, this patrol, and like the lead guy is this old grizzled uh, army scout, and he sees one of the horses from the cowboy's outfit that he wants. And so he just makes up a, a reason to have this kind of requisition of this animal and to kind of make it sh uh, this story a little shorter. Newt steps in and grabs the horse's reins. And it's like, no, no, this is Dish Boggett. This is his horse. You can't have this horse, sir. And he's like, no, I, I, I want it. And the army asks for it. He's like, sir, I'm sorry. I can't let you have this horse. After which, and upon which, this, uh, I, this soldier becomes irate, this old scout, he pulls out his horse quirt, and he starts beating, left and right, beating Newt. The next scene <clears throat> is, is uh, you've got Woodrow, if you will, coming out, Woodrow Call, Call's coming out holding this bag of, sack of oats is what it looks like, and he turns, and the camera pans down the main street, and far in the distance, you see this old boy beating the dog out of Newt. And so he immediately drops his sack of oats, and, and uh, Tommy Lee Jones gets on. By the way, just a little, you know, little uh, note here. Tommy Lee Jones from San Saba, Texas, he brought his own horse to play in this movie, right? It's like horse played by Tommy Lee Jones' horse. So he gets on his own horse. But the character call goes at a breakneck pace on the horse, runs into, literally runs into the horse where the army scout's on, knocks the army scout and the horse down, and then call proceeds to kick the scout in his face, and then he's close to a blacksmith, a farrier, and pulls out a horse iron, like a branding iron, kind of tests its weight, and he just starts hitting this old boy like left and right. I mean, it's brutal. I mean, it's, it's violent. So much so that Newt turns to Gus and says, Gus, uh, Call's killing this guy. And as you see, you see Call, Call is just in a blind rage. I mean, he's just waylaying this guy. Blood's everywhere. <clears throat> and then the next thing you see is a lasso around him. And he starts getting pulled back. And when you turn around, it's Gus on his horse who's actually corralling Call backwards, and the whole time he's saying, Call, it's me, it's Gus, it's me, it's Gus. And then Call snaps out of it. And you know he snaps out of it because what he does is he starts to pat the leg like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm, 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 I'm kind of back to my senses. And then after the lasso's off of him, he stands, and the whole townspeople have gathered around like, this guy's crazy. What? And so as not to be embarrassed... Call just, this is this famous line in the movie that he just makes it up because he doesn't want it 
He doesn't want it to know like why he would do this for Newt and no one else. But here's what he says. He says this. He talks to all these townspeople that are looking at him like mouths the gape and eyes open. He says, I hate rude behavior in a man. I won't tolerate it. And then he just walks off. That's it. <laughs> you, you did all of that, beat a guy an inch within, his li- uh, within an inch of his life because you just thought he was rude. But it doesn't work for the audience, for the viewer, or if you're reading the book. It's too late. Call shows his hand. See, the reason he flies into this blind rage is he has this incredible devotion to this kid named Newt. And the reason he's got a devotion to this kid named Newt is because that really is his kid. And he's got this allegiance as a father does to a son. See, like, if you watch that scene and you don't have any kids and you're single, you're like, golly, that guy's pretty violent. But if you have children, you're like, hit him again, Call. Hit him again. <laughs> it's just different. It's just, that's the power of allegiances. Now, what, what, what does allegiance have to do with church and our whole series on unity, nothing. I just want to talk about Lonesome Dove because I love that book. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's not true. It does. Let's be honest. Listen, here, let me, let, me get, let, me, let me get serious for a second. We live on a planet right now that it seems like everyone's at each other's throats. And I'll just give some easy examples. If you take social media like, like Twitter or Facebook, what have you, uh, those, those areas and arenas are rife with conflict. But did you know that those social platforms are designed to do that? They really are. Uh, There are algorithms, social media companies use algorithms to curate information like what you've been typing into a search, whatever you Google, whatever you're searching for, uh, any kind of website that you click on, it tracks you. Even your smartphone picks up what you say. You ever had that happen where you're talking about something, all of a sudden there's there's like an ad for you, like how do they get that? Because it listens to you 24-7. As long as it's on, it's listening to you. And so what happens is... uh, these, these algorithms basically do this. They filter knowing what you search for, the things that you see, and what you like to read about. It has a filter. It filters all these, the, the news you read, the friends that you, the people you befriend that become your, your Facebook friends or what have you, and, um, and the posts that you see in such a way that it, it, it tries to line up with the worldview that you already have and confirms any biases that you have in it. Now what they say it, it creates is it's called technically a filter bubble. It, a, a bubble, if you will, like that, that you live within that reaffirms the world that you think is how it should be. So, for example, like if you're just, you're, you're, when you t- state about what you believe about God or about, you know, you're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my take on masks or here's what I think about COVID. By the way, that's my typing here. Here's what I think about COVID or whatever, whatever gets you going. Um, you tend to get a lot of likes. Like your like button, like a lot of thumbs up and, and maybe a few thumbs down, but a vast majority are going to be thumbs up. You know why? Because those social media companies, have, they're, they're pushing people and things to you that reaffirm what you believe and they kind of take away the things that wouldn't, right? And so what happens is it creates a filter bubble. It's just another word for an echo chamber. It just makes you sound like you think that you're incredibly smart, but the truth is not a lot of people are disagreeing with you. And then when you find those minority people that actually go, well, I don't think that you're right, you can fire off at them with all this vitriol and hatred because you know that if you do, you got all these likes afterwards. Like, oh, I did the right, hit them one more time, Cal. And sadly, it creates this illusion like we know how to engage people that are different than us and have different viewpoints than us when all really it's just a laboratory on how to increase our strife all the more. And they, I'm just telling you people, the, the people that know and created social media, they know all this stuff. Let me, here's what Bill Gates said about all this. He said this, technology such as social media lets you go off with like-minded people. That's the point, filter bubble so that you're not mixing and sharing and understanding other points of view. It's super important because it makes them money. It's turned out to be more of a problem than I or many others would have expected. Huh, go figure. Been a problem, right? Now see, you got all that in a filter bubble, then you have to have a global pandemic that makes you online more than you've ever been in all of your life, and all of a sudden now we got this cauldron bubbling and boiling that says this, you know what? It really is gonna get contentious in here. Now all that, doesn't just stay in the world, it trickles down into the church as well. And now it it hits navigators and small group leaders and pastors and people are mad here and you know, it's just crazy. And what always has been, I think, weird to me is that you have believers, followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the same congregation even, who will speak to each other in ways online that they would never do face to face. They're keyboard cowards is what it is. Because it's really, it's really easy to talk tough until you have to see someone face to face 
which is what the church was really good at, face-to-face stuff, right? And yet, what happens is people get hurt, relationships get strained, and church unity takes a hit. Now, let me tell you why I, a part of the reason I think that, that, that it does so. And it has to do with allegiance. Now, Merriam-Webster's defines allegiance this way. Let me quote it for you. It's, quote, devotion or loyalty to a person, group, or a cause. Now, what that, mean, what, what that definition tells me is that I don't, like, the, 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 we don't just have an allegiance. We have allegiance says. It's not singular, it's plural. And it makes sense because I find myself personally devoted to a lot of different things. I mean, take the definition. I have, a, I have devotion or loyalty to a lot of people and groups and, what else is it, causes, I'm devoted to my wife. I mean, this ring on my ring finger tells you that I'm devoted to my wife. I'm devoted to my kids. I'm devoted to my friends. I'm devoted to my university. I went to Baylor, sick and bears. I'm devoted to the bears. I'm devoted to um, the church that I'm a part of. I'm devoted to the people. Like if, if people get on to Clear Creekers and they're not Clear Creekers, I just, I'm, I'm tempted to want to pick up a branding iron and go to town. That's just how I feel. I just feel I have an allegiance there. I'm, I'm, I'm allegiant to the staff that we have, the elders that we have. And you can also add to that list your, your allegiance to nations and states and political parties and causes, blah, 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 blah. So generally speaking, having allegiances in the plural is not a bad thing. In fact, that's just kind of normal. So when is it problematic when those allegiances lead to, same things like, lead to things like disunity? So here's the deal. Before I get into all that, let me just say this. Our heart has an order of allegiances. Now we, you know, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. We just, I just had our staff, uh, our, our communications and arts teams put this together. Just think about this as not, just the things that you're devoted to. It's why it's in the heart. You're devoted to these. You're, you're committed to these. You have loyalty to these. And everyone's order is different. Some of you may love your college team. You know, we have, I, I joke with Aggies all the time. Thank you for just enduring me, but they're some of the most faithful people when it comes to their sports. So for some Ags, right, or Longhorns or whoever, college football is going to be up there. You know what? Do I love my spouse or college switches? You know, you're just debating, right? But let's just say it's high up on the list. Now, other people might say, all right, for you, college football is three. I'm just making something up. But for me, it's, it's not. I have a hobby there. It's fishing or it's uh, sailing or it, you know, what, gardening, whatever, right? Um, that's okay. But here's where I want to make a turn. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, right? If you're someone that says that Jesus is your Lord and Master, there is an allegiance that you've got to have, obviously, that trumps all the others. And so let me show you what that looks like, but not kind of what I think, but I want you to hear it from the words of Jesus, especially as he interacts with people when it comes to allegiance. So if you have a Bible... I'd love for you to turn with me to John chapter 6. If you have it on your smartphone, go to John chapter 6. Um, it's super important that we work through this. I know it's on the screen here, but we're not going to talk about it just yet because I need to give you some background to this so you can understand what's going on here. Uh, as you're turning there, we'll look at John chapter 6. Uh, we'll look at verses 60 and on here in a second. But the background is, is as such. Jesus has just done a miracle <clears throat> and that he had a bunch of people following him. And they were hungry, and there were about 5,000 people there, and so he takes some loaves and fishes, and he multiplies them. It's a very famous miracle in the Bible. And so he multiplies these loaves and fishes, and he feeds the multitudes there. But when the multitudes wake up the next day, they see that Jesus has taken off like, yo, why did he leave? And so they, they, they get in, in mass, they go try to find him, and they find Jesus in a, in not too far away in another town called Capernaum. And Jesus is with his 12 disciples and by disciples, I mean like capital D, what we call the, like the main 12 people that followed him, Peter and so on and so forth, what were known as the apostles later on. They're with Jesus as Jesus is teaching in a synagogue. And they're like, Jesus, man, hold on. They catch up with Christ. And they're like, why, why, did, why did you leave us? And here's what Jesus proceeds to tell them. He's like, essentially, he tells them this. The reason I left you guys is because um, you only wanted to follow me when your bellies were, were full. You just wanted a free meal. You didn't really want me. And, and then uh, they, they respond by saying, well, listen, if you're from God, God fed his people in, in the desert with manna from heaven, so God feeds his people. You fed us if you think that you are who you say you are. And then Jesus tells them something very interesting. He says here, verses uh, 25 through 26 here, Jesus said to this crowd, I'm the bread of life. Like they're talking about being fed with bread and manna. He's like, listen, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you've seen me, and yet you don't believe. So you guys are talking about food. Listen, I am the food from God. I am God, the bread of life. 
and you don't believe me. Now, it didn't go over well. When he said that to him, like, this God, that, I mean, listen, he thinks he's the bread of life, he's the manna from heaven, oh, don't, he, he thinks he's pretty special, doesn't he? And it was hard on those who'd been following Jesus. Here's what I want to do. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 60 uh, and on. So um, in verse 60, it says this, and we're going to break this down here in a second. When many of his disciples, now when I say disciples, I'm talking about in the context of this, this, this passage, this is little, lowercase d disciples. This isn't the 12. These are like the people that said, I'm on the Jesus train, and we're following Jesus, and they caught up with him at Capernaum. When that group heard it, they said this, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now think about what it says there. They no longer walked with him. That's just a euphemism that says they jumped off the Jesus train. So they're gathering around and Jesus says, this is who I am. They're like, yo, that's way too much for us. Uh, we're not going to follow Jesus anymore. Just here, We're going to turn in our Christian cards. We're done, right? And so th there's this awkward moment. There's this whole crew. Now remember, he fed 5,000. A huge chunk of those people came to follow him and said, hey, man, are you, hey, why did you leave us? He's like, ah, you guys are just consumers, I don't do consumers. You just, you just want me for what I give you. You don't want me for me. I don't have any time for you guys. They're like, well, why would you feel that way? Because I am the Messiah. I'm the king. I'm the bread of life. Well, that's too much. We're out. So what you have left with is Jesus and the 12. Pretty awkward now. They're by themselves. And you think, like, Jesus, is he going to be mad? I Look what Jesus does in verse 67. So Jesus says to the 12, do you want to go away as well? <laughs> but that was a fun conversation. So, so all these people leave, right? And notice Jesus doesn't bat an eye. He's not crying over like, please come back, because he doesn't care because he's not negotiating himself. Jesus doesn't negotiate the gospel. He never soft sells to people just to get them to believe him or not. That's not how Jesus does it. He says they're essentially consumers, and he wanted them, they wanted him to be their product, and Jesus just doesn't play that game. So what Jesus does is this. When they all leave, he turns to his most committed, the disciples, capital D, if you will, uppercase, and he says to them, all right, boys, y'all want to take off too? Y'all want to leave? And then Peter, who's kind of an impetuous person up to this point, he's kind of a loud mouth, but this time he just steps in and steps up. He, on behalf of the rest of the 12, the 11, becomes their spokesman. And here's what he says. Verse 68. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I love it. Like, they, they get it. They get it. Peter steps in on behalf of the other 11. They're like, Here, here's the deal, Jesus. Um, where would we go to find someone else who's going to tell us the words of eternal salvation? And better yet, you are who you said you are. Notice the two terms he uses here. He's like, you're the Lord. You're the Holy One of God. You know what, what Peter's doing here on behalf of the 12? He's pledging his allegiance. They're all pledging their allegiance to Jesus. I mean, those words show you that. Lord, which means master or king, not just a term of just sir here, but it's, it's a term of, of leadership and royalty, and then holy one of God. That's, it's, those are messianic terms. Here's essentially what, what, what Peter's saying. He's saying, Jesus, of course we're going to follow you. You're, you're the king. Not just a king, you're the king of the universe. You're the king of creation. You're the king of the kingdom of God. What he's essentially saying is this. He's saying what this means is our greatest allegiance, our greatest devotion, our greatest loyalty lies in you and in you alone, Jesus. And just so you know, this passage is not like special. It's not just for special Christians or super committed Christians or Christians who love to wear Christian t-shirts or listen to Christian music. This is just for th this pattern and this example is for anyone who calls themselves a follower of Jesus. Anyone who's ever existed and said, I'm a Christian. Every person who claims to be a Christian has to have their first and foremost allegiance be to Jesus, the King, who's the Holy One of God. And just so you know, that's how Jesus acted. That's the expectation that Jesus had. Let, let me take you to a passage in Luke chapter 14. And let's look at verse 26. It says, Jesus says, now people are always wanting to follow him, right? Because he's kind of the hot thing. He's what you'd see on TikTok or Twitter or Facebook. Everyone wants a piece of him. And then he turns around and says this. Hey, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. How many of y'all want to sign up now? 
No, I mean, how many of you want to sign up now? Because that's what Jesus is saying. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Unless you hate your mom and your dad. Unless you hate your brothers and sisters. Like, if you're growing up and you're little, that might one, that could work probably, right? But if not, like, he even goes so far as to say, listen, just your own life, you got to hate it. Now, before we get all twisted and messed up by it, we need to understand Jesus is speaking in a way that was very um, common in the Semitic culture, and it uses the term, it uses hyperbole, where you make statements that, of extremes to prove a point. He does the same thing later, where he says, hey, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And you don't see any kind of blind, one-armed people following Jesus and the disciples, right? They have all, I mean, he would have healed them anyhow, healed them anyhow I guess, but you don't see that. Why? Because they understood the context. He's speaking with hyperbole. He does the same thing here, but here, here's his point. Jesus is saying, Take all your allegiances and your order of allegiances. And unless I'm going to be number one, just don't follow me. Because somewhere down the road, you're going to have a conflict with me. And whatever allegiances you have above me on the chart, they're going to win out. So it's just to your family or to your marriage or to your money or to your stuff or to your sports or to your whatever it is. When push comes to shove, you're going to be like everybody else in John 6. You're going to turn and walk away and not come back because you just wanted me for what I could give you. You didn't want me for being me. And I'm the king of the universe, brother. So if you don't want that, don't follow me. In fact, that's why he follows up in the very, look, look, look at the very next verse, just verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Not like you might be able to. It's like you cannot be my disciple if you don't do what? If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to come. This is so This is great to talk to to 21st century moderns who are suburbanites and have a little bit of wealth who think the world revolves around them just like we all do, including myself. It's just real easy, right? Have it your way. We got some mobility to do whatever we want to do. The, the 0.1% of the, of the globe is here. And then Jesus says this, hey, 0.1% of the globe, here's what you need to realize. If you want to continue to be the Lord and master of your life, you don't need to think about me. But if you want me to be the king and master of your life, then come on in. But someone's got to be in the throne, and it can't be you, and it can't be anything else that you have allegiance to. Like, I have to be on that throne with your greatest allegiance. you know why? Because allegiance is everything. Thus, for followers of Jesus, their allegiance to Jesus ultimately is everything. Greater than your allegiance to a political party, we are sworn to King Jesus. Right? In fact, I would say this, um, King Jesus has to be that top bar. In, in fact, um, I would even say this. Once he, once he sees this, he doesn't come to obliterate all your other allegiances. They don't, unless they're just sinful, and, and maybe he does. But if you have like, well, I got college football, or I've, I've got my family, or my spouse, or my children, or my, whatever. D -d -d are they gone? No, 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 no. Just, they get reordered and reshuffled and reframed under the lordship of Jesus. That's what a Christian looks like. That's how Jesus defines it. And that's why a bunch of people in John 6 said, we're not in anymore, because we don't believe you really are the king. But it's also why Peter and the rest of the disciples said, we're in. Where can we go? You know why? Because you are the king. And you're greater than all of our political affiliations. You're greater than all of our, I mean, as much as you love the nation or love our blessed Texas, right? We're still greater parts of the citizens of the kingdom of God. And no matter what, topics or things that you and I can get in scraps about in person, online, or wherever with another sincere believer. We have to understand if he's our king, we're a part of a kingdom, we're a part of a family, and the family of God. So, so here's what I, here, just a way to think about it is this way. You want to find a good motivation for unity in a church that has a lot of different backgrounds and a lot of differences of opinions, right? Here's what you have to do. You have to continually remind yourself in your heart about where your greatest allegiance lies. And I'm telling you, if it's not Jesus, that's what you're working towards, that it will be. Because you want Jesus to be the thing that defines you ultimately. You've got to have your greatest allegiance to be Jesus if you want to have the kind of unity that God desires. And, and I'll show you why that works and how that works. Now, it is no secret, if you've heard me long enough, that I'm a huge Astros fan. Huge. I mean, I love uh, to support the boys of summer in blue and orange. In fact, let me show you a picture of it. So that's, that's me. Uh, this is my wife. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's not. That's my wife, which I was so excited about this photo, I didn't even let her have a chance to look at the camera, apparently. <laughs> this guy's really excited. Uh, that's Orbit, the mascot. If, those of you that don't know anything about the Astros, uh, 
so we're sitting at a game. I, I, go, uh, I don't go to a ton of games. I have in the past. I love the Astros. They're always on my television wherever we're going, whatever we're doing. Now, it's no secret that the Astros... Uh, they're in the golden age of the best baseball that the Astros have ever played in the city of Houston. Trash can scandal, not even withstanding. I mean, last year, we're one game away from going to the World Series. We were in the series, World Series the year before that, and Game 7 had a chance to win it all. We're, we're good, we've been good, and hopefully we'll continue to be somewhat good in the future, right? <laughs> but if you've ever been to Minute Maid Park, here, here's why I'm telling you this story, right? Especially during a playoff game, stakes are high. It's all on. You can feel it in every pitch. It's sold out, not an empty seat. And what do you find when you get there? Everyone who's an Astro fan dons the colors. You got orange on or these jerseys, that, this and the other. You got these Astro hats on. Everyone's got their their hats on, whether they're blue or orange or whatever with the star. It's just awesome, right? But then there there, there are people that show up that just want to up their up the game. They want to up their clothes game, their sports, their sports (laughs) quality. So you got this guy, right? You got this guy. By the way, people call that guy not a fan, just an alcoholic. I think that's too strong. I would just say, I'd just say he's efficient. He's probably an engineer. It's probably why we landed on the moon and going to Mars for this kind of guy, right? By the way, that's Bruce Wesley. We just took a snap of him while he was there. You know, Crawford, Bach, tall boys. I mean, why not? So, uh, but what's, what's crazy is when you get there, no one thinks this is weird. This is just normal. This is just, and you tell he's a fan, right? And they thought, you think this guy's up this game? Then you got people that are dressed from head to toe in these suits. Like, these guys are up in their game. By the way, if you've ever watched the Astros for long enough, they always show these guys. This guy's a lawyer. I think this is his lawyer buddy. I mean, he's got, I mean, he's got like this sweet Astros belt buckle. I love it all. Uh, these guys, just show you, man, this is what, it's, it's not a bad 70s sitcom that you just entered into. These are just fans. So much so that they now, if you go to the Astro store, they sell these and they sell shorts. Like, I wanted to buy a pair of shorts like this, and my wife was like, if you want to stay married to me, you ain't going to buy those shorts. <laughs> but I thought they were tight because they'd be perfect at the playoff games. And then there are people that have upped their games even more. They, they, they wear these space helmets. Check this out. These are people now at the playoffs with space helmets, right? <laughs> now, go walk around town wearing that, see if people let you into the restaurant, right? It's a mask. It can work, right? <clears throat> but the truth is, I don't know what this guy's saying. He's probably thinking, was this a wise decision to wear this today? <laughs> but here's what I think. I'm thinking, when I first saw that, I'm like, I would never wear that even if I was playing Spaceman growing up, right? And then, but when you're in the playoffs, people are wearing those towels, right? And the music's going on. I look at something like that, I'm like thinking, I wonder how much those things cost on Amazon. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I, might, I might have to buy some of them. All right, you can take that off. This. Thank you, because no, no one would listen to one word I have to say. Like, look at the space people up there, right? See what I'm saying? Once the game's on, it doesn't matter. As long as you don the colors, dress however you like, as long as we know that you're on with the team with the Astros. So here's how that plays out. One, one, one of those playoff games, we're playing the Red Sox. I was fortunate enough to get playoff tickets. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm up there. I think, we're in the, I think I'm in one of the upper deck stands because I don't roll like some of y'all. I just yeah, I get whatever I can get, right? So I'm up there breathing an oxygen tank, watching the game. <laughs> and there's this guy behind me who, uh, first of all, he's drunk, uh, not even in the first inning. He's this big old burly guy, and he's got a lot of piercings. I feel like, I would stop, because I'm going to get in trouble if I say something. He's got a lot of piercings. He looks like from the 80s, if y'all ever watched the good Christian movie, Hellraiser, where he had pinhead, where the, the things were sticking out. That's what the guy looked like. I was like, man, don't touch this guy. Balloons, beware. And so, but he also has like tattoos all over his face, like some kid drove, you know, did a road map on it, but it was bouncing in the back of the bus and he didn't do it right because it's all over, right? He's scary. And because he's half drunk, he's yelling at everybody, but only if you're not wearing the colors. So he's yelling at Red Sox fans, Red Sox, I hate you guys. Hey, you over there, buddy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're getting in a fight. I have to lasso him and pull him back and it's going to be awkward. And I'm just like, this is not how I wanted to do this. But once the game gets going, I get fairly focused and intense. And in a playoff game, it's every pitch. It's every pitch counts. So we're all in on this. <laughs> and even though this guy's obnoxious, we still get through the deal. Because you pay all this money, you're going to watch this game, right? And so the Astros, this is the game where somewhere late in the game, I don't know if it's Altuve or Springer or somebody, they just jack a ball all the way out in the Crawford boxes. And the minute it 
pops, you just know it sounds right. Everyone starts to stand up, and usually we're standing up the whole time anyhow, and everyone's looking right, and that ball starts to take that trajectory, and you're like, oh, this is, this is definitely getting in the Crawford boxes. And even though you know intellectually, scientifically, it's going to get there, it doesn't matter until it gets into the Crawford boxes, and once it lands in there, people just go crazy. Yeah! Because you know, have you ever noticed this? People never celebrate alone when they're in community. Wouldn't it be awkward if the guy by himself like, oh, that's awesome, that's great, way to go. Like, that would be like, this guy's got a problem. You always celebrate when you're in community, you celebrate with community when you all see and experience the same things together. So here's what happens. A long story just to tell you this. I, I, I'm jumping up and down, giving people high fives, it's awesome, I don't know any of these people, right? And I turn around and I see this dude, and he and I just embrace like we're reunited war heroes. Like, oh my gosh, I missed you in Saigon. I mean, it's like crazy, like we just... I don't know how, I'm kind of dodging his face because I don't want to get it punctured, but I mean, it was awesome. And I'm just thinking, all of a sudden, we were like, looked like we were best friends celebrating this home run, right? That's the kind of, um, that's the kind of unity that's the product of an allegiance. See, think of it this way. In Minute Maid Park, there are all kinds of people, red and yellow, black and brown, uh, People of different ethnicities. Uh, there's probably Republicans and Democrats and independents, all kinds of political affiliations there. You've got uh, inner city people. You've got suburbanites. You've got steak eaters. You've got people that eat tofu, right? God bless them. You've got uh, people with spikes on their faces and you know, like normal people. I don't know how else to describe the other side. So you got them all there, right? And we didn't care about any of those things because we're all donning the same colors. Didn't care about any of those things. Like, in the end, those things didn't matter because in the stadium, the highest allegiance is to the Strohs, and if you just donned the colors of the Strohs, we were all big one family, right? Now, again, surely there are people there that are like, that guy behind me, Spike Face, I don't know what else to call him, he's probably a really nice guy, probably like a CEO somewhere, but like, Spike Face and I probably have a lot of disagreements, Probably don't shop at the same places. I, we, we, he may go left, I may go right, he may go up, I may go down, he may go out, I may go in. None of that mattered! Because in the stadium, the highest priority is, do you don the colors? Do you support the Strohs? And if that's your highest allegiance in that arena, ha, ah, guess what? You can actually high five people and embrace people and celebrate with people that don't see things the way you do because those were lesser allegiances in that place. So this is what's true about the community of faith that God has in the gospel, his gospel people. Except the difference is, the stadium that God has is much bigger than Minute Maid Park. It's the entire universe. All the earth is full of his glory and all there within. And as long as you're donning the colors of the king, then we can get along. We can have unity in all of that. You know why? Because if it's our highest allegiance, then that's what determines our unity, not lesser allegiances. And you can have lesser allegiances, and they don't even have to be to the same thing. You can have like, I like this party, and I like that party, and I like this opinion, and I like that opinion. And again, ultimately, if our allegiance on the top level is Jesus, ah, guess what? We can hug and embrace and celebrate and grow together, even disagree with each other, but do it in a way that's not trying to always beat somebody down, but trying to love somebody well, and that changes the whole tone and tenor of a conversation. It's the power of unity. See, we live like that, and we'll look less like the world and maybe more like the king. And when other people get tired of Jesus because of the demands that he makes, and they conflict with their other allegiances, and they just, like the people in John 6, they just get up and walk off, and Jesus turns to us and says, you want to walk off too? We're like, no way. You not only have the words of eternal life, you're the king, where else are we going to go? No, 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 no. We're staying here right with you. You know why? Because you're the Lord. You're the Holy One of God. That's how. That's how your allegiances and your allegiance helps you stay united. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the goodness of Jesus. Thank you for the blood shed for us. Really, that's the color. <laughs> the color that washes us all clean. All of, who are, all of us who are followers of Jesus, Lord, I just know it's, it's a check to my own heart about where my allegiances lie, that my chief allegiance, our chief allegiance as followers of yours is to be Jesus himself, the king. And Lord, if there's, any been, uh, uh, there's ever been times in my life, and I know that there have been, where I don't really act like Jesus is my chief allegiance, Lord, I pray that I would repent well of that and that we would all grow in knowing that when we don the colors of the kingdom, that truly is what gives us our direction and the unity that we have so that we can say to you that you are the Holy One.
you have sent Christ as the Holy One from God, who is the Lord over all. We pray this in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord. Amen. So who is your king? You know, a few weeks ago, we were singing this song at a student event called Mixed Weekend. And as we were singing the lyrics, I just want you, I just want you, nothing else. I felt this conviction in my heart that um, it's like the Holy Spirit was asking me, is that true? And I have to be honest and confess that it wasn't at that time. And oftentimes it isn't. I had to repent. And oftentimes we do. We feel this recognition of like what Yancey was talking about, our ultimate allegiance not being in Jesus, our identity being found in other things. And it creates this disunity, not only just in our relationships with others in the church, but even in our relationship with God, a disunity in our relationship with God. And so I had to repent of that. Jesus, be my ultimate allegiance. Be my first thing. Be the king on the throne of my life. And maybe that's what you're feeling now after hearing him speak. Maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart. And I'd like to just invite you in this moment as we sing this song to just take this opportunity to confess those things to Jesus, to repent of that to draw near to him again, to crown him king of your life again. And even as we sing, I'm sorry, make that the prayer of your heart. So let's sing that together. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I just go through the motions I'm sorry When I forget that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you Cause I just want you Nothing else And nothing else Nothing else will do I just want Nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, Jesus, and nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, and nothing else, Jesus, and nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else. Oh, nothing else, and nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, oh, nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I hope as you sing that, that you're reminded that it's not about how much you can do for Jesus. It's not about how you can perform for him. He, he loves you. He wants to be with you. And I hope that you're reminded of a love maybe that you once had or that you wish you had to just be in his presence, just worshiping him, just exalting him. So even now, right where you are, just begin to tell Jesus, Jesus, you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. You have have earned the crown of king in my life. By your death, by your resurrection, you are alive. 
seated in power and glory and all the honor belongs to you. And as we sing that, would you, would you place him on that throne, giving him the praise of your life. He's worthy of your devotion. He's worthy of your dedication. He's worthy of your love, your attention, your affection. So right where you're sitting, sing this with us. He lives. He lives. All honor and power are His. All glory forever. Jesus lives. See the tomb where he lay see this stone rolled away he is risen he is risen he's alive see his hands see his hands see his feet touch his scars and believe he is risen he is risen he's alive yes he is oh shackles breaking free hear this song of the redeemed he is moving he is moving he's alive oh so take this freedom take this love can you feel it rising up oh he is here he is here oh he's alive oh he
Well, like Yancey said, when our chief allegiance is to Christ, man, it reorders all of our other priorities. And then we make room for unity in a divided world. See, unity isn't just conformity, it's about prioritizing those allegiances. And when all of our lives collectively are submitted to Christ, we can be unified in the church. And so I'm praying for that this week. And I wanna challenge you to pray with us for unity this week. And I wanna encourage you and challenge you to take a next step with us. So at the beginning of every online service, we challenge you to connect if you're not connected. So you can go to clearcreek.org, you can see all the ways you can join us as a local church. But at the end of every service, we also conclude with a question on the screen, kind of a, a challenge. We want you to consider and, and apply what God has been saying to you. And so maybe even ask the people that you're watching this together with today, because our hope is that when we come to the scriptures together, we would leave changed people because of what God has said to us. So consider this question on the screen and I challenge you to take a next step with us this week.